so next up is Ben Cartwright Cox from London. You are from London, aren't you? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, Ben's going to talk about discovering flaws in BGP error handling. Ben um, is the founder of BGP Tools, and it's your first time presenting. Mm -hmm. No, no. For, yeah. But later this week, he'll be presenting again. So if you really like him, come back for round two. Ben. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. Um, so we've had the regulation. We've had the prevention. So uh, let's break some stuff. Um, so hi, I'm Ben. Uh, this is BGP error handling. Uh, this is a rehash of one of my blog posts, um, but uh, with some more detail, hopefully. So um, the first important mandatory, um, I run a business that is involves being connected to many IXP root servers and people and various different networks. Um, what I'm about to tell you is about what I'm about to show you is about the things to break routers. I'm not going to test any of these things or never will test any of these things on my customers or partners. Um, all of the testing that has been done in this talk has been done on uh, GNS free virtual machines or um, physical hardware in different VLANs. So context. So um, semi recently, a Brazilian network announced this IPv6 root with a really spicy BGP attribute. This attribute and the spicy BGP, this root and the spicy attribute got carried really far. Um, so this had the downside of uh, causing any Junos device uh, that ingested it to tear down the session that it received it from. Uh, this is okay-ish for pairing. Uh, this is very much less okay for transit. Um, so Colt um, AS8220 um, seems to have been basically fully IPv6 de-peered uh, from the internet when this happened. Uh, a whole bunch of other networks got impacted too um, from this incident, but um, Colt was the one that inconvenienced me, so that's the one that I noticed. Um, so the payload on this uh, was actually super boring. Um, so it appears to be something that was originated from this Brazilian network, um, an attribute 28, BGP entropy label capability attribute. Um, I would assume based on uh, reading the RFCs and who it's from, uh, this was almost definitely originated from a Huawei device um, and probably a genuine accident. Um, the attribute wasn't technically uh, corrupted. Um, however, uh, mishandling on certain Junos versions um, up until recently uh, caused this to basically um, if, this, if a Junos device ingested this, uh, it would just reset the BGP session there and then, uh, assuming it hadn't had a specific mitigating config. So um, that's pretty bad. That um, took some pretty serious damage to some networks. Uh, so what is a BGP attribute? What are these things? So there's two sections to a BGP update. Uh, one is the NRLI and the withdraw data, basically which prefixes that the update applies to. And then there's the second stuff. There's the attributes. That contains things that uh, you would normally do things like traffic engineering on, things like the AS path, the community values, the pref, med, et cetera. Um, so uh, the stuff that we're talking about here are attributes. There are a lot of attributes out there. Um, most of them are uh, there's 209 slots of these things. It's an 8-bit value. 209 of them are unassigned. Um, 14 are, are documented as deprecated, uh, meaning that they should not be used anymore and should not really be on the internet. And 32 of these are active. Now, active is relative. Uh, active is in active on the open table on the internet. Not so much. That number is much lower. Uh, active in people's IGPs where things can get weird and you run various vendor integrations. Maybe so. Um, but you would assume that these are all correctly handled, right? So let's, uh, let's have an ungood scenario. Uh, so we're on a nice internet exchange, right? Everyone's happy and we're all connected to the root server. Uh, and then someone goes, um, hey guys, uh, check out this really cool BGP attribute I found. Um, and then some people get blown up. Um, so what you really want to avoid is, is a situation like this. But in fact, there are much worse situations for something like this to happen. Uh, so a really ungreat scenario is something like this. So you have the same setup. Um, except someone uh, points the BGP attribute uh, weapon uh, towards a transit carrier. Now, uh, due to the rules of how BGP attributes propagate, uh, what will happen is uh, it'll travel down NTT, travel through Cogent, and eventually hit the device that you're trying to target, um, which will cause effectively a global wipeout of the specific vendor that you're trying to target, um, which is extremely bad. Um, funnily enough, um, RFC 7606 has a uh, description of this exact issue. Um, I won't read the entire thing out for you, but um, it basically just says, uh, since significant fan out can occur between the attacker and the routers that do recognize the attribute types, this attack could be potentially harmful, <laughs> um, which pretty much uh, is bang on the money. Um, very rarely in my experience of reading RFCs has the RFC security section been extremely accurate uh, to what I've actually ended up finding, but turns out this one, straight on, straight on point. Um, so my goal from that point onwards was how do we detect as many of these issues as possible. Because it's clear that these issues exist, and it's clear that this is not a research area that has been tested. Um, well, it is tested accidentally through people's um, mistakes. 
um, but I want to actively test and find these problems before they are on the internet themselves and causing problems. So uh, I decided to write a, a fuzzer. A fuzzer is a program which basically is designed to put random data in, or almost tactically random data in, uh, into programs to see uh, what happens. Uh, so to try and touch as many different code points as humanly possible, um, or I, I guess as machinely as possible. Um, so uh, the idea is, is you go through all of the BGP attribute types, you put progressively random uh, data in them, um, and see what happens. Now, to make this particularly interesting, because I'm searching for what are effectively BGP worms, um, so something that goes and carries across multiple different providers until it hits a target device and breaks it, um, I also decided to pump uh, these messages via a Bird2 um, routing daemon. Uh, the reason I did this is that I trust Bird2's uh, general handling logic to be particularly good. Um, I have tested it before in um, another scenario, and it was particularly good at handling um, bad data and corrupted attributes. Um, but also the fact that uh, Bird2 is used uh, significantly on a lot of IXP root servers. So if the target is specifically just to hit people on root servers, then that's what the software uh, that you'd need to make it through. Um, so uh, in order to do this, uh, unattendedly, uh, the goal that we need now to do is to set up a whole bunch of vendors, um, which I'll be calling the device under test, the DUT. Um, and the way this works is that the DUT announces a prefix uh, that the fuzzing script monitors uh, for basically disappearing. If it disappears, then it knows that what it just said has just killed the other side. Roughly looking somewhere like this, two prefixes, the DUT announces one thing, and then the fuzzer monitors um, that prefix. The fuzzer outputs updates for a, another prefix. Um, all both, both go through the bird relay, and then we see what happens. So the question is, what did we find? Oh, sorry, this is what it looks like when it's running. Um, so in bird, at least, you can detect uh, unknown attributes um, by the fact that uh, it puts BGP, and then here you can see echo Charlie, uh, and that means that's the hex code of the BGP attribute. T means it's transitive. That means that uh, that's instructions to routers to say, if you don't know what this attribute is, just carry it on to the next person or the next router. Uh, that's what allows these uh, BGP worms to be incredibly harmful, uh, is that BGP allows you to set a flag that says, if you don't know what this is, just pass it on. Uh, so you can get something that unknown data propagates all the way to every router um, that doesn't understand it, because it doesn't understand it. So what did the fuzzer find? So first starting on, uh, Microtik, zero issues, did not log a single error. Uh, this was on router OS 7.7. .7. I hadn't uh, gone through the effort of testing every single version of router OS. Router OS is slightly uh, infamous for requiring uh, a very different behavior, even on the point releases. Um, but 7.7, .7, as far as I understand, flawless, um, on the BGP handling part, at least. Um, Ubiquity, also not a problem. Uh, I suspect that they forked their version of Quagga uh, long before it grew any of the features that would soon to be end up problematic. Um, but as far as I understand it, from my latest release of Edge OS on a test device, flawless. Arista EOS, um, no errors, no obvious logging, although I'm assured by someone later on that there is logging inside um, EOS. Uh, I just couldn't find it. You can check for the withdrawal behavior. Uh, it does actually detect these things and mitigates them for you. If you run show IPG, BB, show IP BGP neighbors update errors, it will go and tell you uh, has it encountered any stuff that it didn't like. Cisco iOS XE and XR. No errors. Uh, it logs the issue very verbosely, um, perhaps a little bit too verbosely. If you're on a serial console on this thing and this is spamming out, that can get very annoying. Um, you can turn it off, but obviously then it's slightly more invisible on what's going on. But um, Cisco handles this incredibly well, almost definitely because in the past uh, there has been a round of these issues that impacted Cisco, particularly uh, nastily, and Cisco seems to have done the right thing and just fixed the problem uh, for both of their devices. So if you're running a Cisco IIC or SR device, the chances are more than overwhelmingly, uh, assuming you're not running a release more than 10 years old, um, then you're probably fine. Um, Junos. So Junos is the one that started this adventure. Uh, it turns out um, while they patched uh, the attribute 23 issue, uh, they did not patch. Oh, I found a second one, um, one upwards, attribute 29, BGP LS. Um, if you send that uh, corrupted BGP LS attribute uh, to a Junos device, it will also reset the session there and then. Um, you can actually mitigate this, and I would highly recommend everyone do so. Uh, if you're running a Junos device, you just need to go and set BGP-error-tolerance in your BGP um, section. I would incredibly recommend everybody do this if you have not done it already. Uh, this does not impact sessions. In a, this doesn't cause a session to re-reset, so you can set it live. Doesn't, it just instantly applies to new behavior. Um, it might reset the sessions if you decide to unset this, but you wouldn't want to do that. Um, you just want to be on the safe data, right? So no need to. Uh, so set BGP tolerance. If you set BGP error tolerance, if you're running Junos, uh, regardless of the fact that, it, regardless if you've updated to the latest versions, uh, which don't have some of these issues, it is much safer just to set this. Um, I hope in some point in the future, that Junos will be interested in setting this as the default behavior, because I think it's in everyone's interest to have routers that don't explode by default. 
um, and instead are just safe by default. Um, the reason I suspect this hasn't been enabled by default is because you know, daemons have a long history. Um, some of these implementations are over 20 years old. Um, and so uh, it's hard to change defaults uh, when everyone is depending on those defaults. But I, I reckon this is a good qualifier for a default that should be changed. Nokia SROS. Uh, there are loads of ways to pop a session on SROS by default. Um, some of them listed over here. Uh, you like Junos, it has the similar mitigation uh, config strategy. Uh, you just go into the BGP group and type uh, error handling update fault tolerance. Same behavior as Junos, you can enable this um, and then commit without any uh, disruption to any of the BGP sessions. Uh, the, in the behavior applies instantaneously, um, and uh, the only downside is if you turn it off, then the sessions reset. But once again, don't do that. You want the, session you want the safe behavior on, there's no known downsides. Uh, I would like to actually thank a few people ahead of time. Uh, I went and reached out to a whole bunch of networks uh, upon discovering this, because uh, while I was assuming that most people were aware of the Junos issues, uh, the SRS ones were relatively uh, unknown. Uh, and so thanks to these people, uh, uh, the redactions are still there, but thanks to some of these people for uh, enabling it on their networks uh, upon me notifying them, uh, as I had issues at the time uh, convincing people to send out uh, security notices. Huawei Net Engine, um, so no problems detected. They seem to have handled this problem just fine. Um, although with the obvious caveat that uh, obtaining Huawei test gear, at least for me, is extremely difficult, um, and images on Huawei are extremely hard to find because uh, I am not also allowed to import any Huawei equipment to my country. Uh, there may be bugs in other products, but not in the NE40 series, so that seems good, or not at least in the versions that I tested. Uh, FRR, um, and FRR is uh, implemented in a load of different vendors. Uh, unfortunately, also uh, explodes on attribute 28, uh, which is tunnel encapsulation. This was assigned to CBE and fixed uh, post-public disclosure. Um, basically, when I published the post, they uh, decided to fix it then, which is a little bit frustrating because I did de declare it ahead of time to them, but whatever. Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, FRR is also implemented in a whole bunch of other products, so things like Sonic and Pico 8, and it's, you find it FRR in loads of different places. Um, Vios is another one. Uh, and so you may find uh, that your vendor does not actually currently have a solution to, for this being upgraded uh, because they haven't upgraded their version of FRR, FRR yet. OpenBGT, Ocean, oh, bleh. Open BGPD uh, also explodes on a relatively new attribute, attribute 35. That's only origin to customer or only to customer. Um, OpenBGPD does by default do the correct behavior. It logs bad packets and turns them into whip draws. Um, OpenBGPD is also interesting um, because it is becoming a, a second source alternative for routing servers or root servers. Uh, because uh, IXP root servers are uh, largely dominated by Bird, uh, which is a great thing. Bird is a fantastic piece of software. However, um, it is getting relatively obvious that a particularly nasty bug in Bird could potentially bring down every single root IXP root server at the same time, which is not great. Uh, and so uh, OpenBGP, OpenBGPD is falling into a sort of second alternative um, for a stable IXP root server. Um, this actually, this bug and fuzzing exposed more than one bug in OpenBGD, um, but only one of them was remotely triggerable. Um, so uh, I'm actually glad that this happened in there. This has been fixed in OpenBGSD 7.3, uh, Arata 06. There's a CV assigned if you want to go and track that, but uh, this should be a relatively simple upgrade. Uh, and now we come on to the, the, the bad one, uh, which is extreme. Uh, so Extreme explodes on two different attributes. Um, two of them are relatively obscure, which actually makes this easier to exploit. Um, there is no mitigating config, um, and due to, the, uh, due to the fact that this is a bizarre, um, these are two relatively unique uh, attributes, uh, you can unfortunately target a bunch of uh, large carriers. Um, the CV is here, but that has currently been distributed by Extreme. I'm going to go into this a little bit more. So uh, Extreme won't commit to fixing this. Um, so they, after a large back and forth on responsible disclosure, I guess, um, they sent me this email at the end, which basically says, we are not considering this a vulnerability due to the presence of RSC 7606. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but the, the second slightly amusing response at the end of that is, um, we are evaluating support for RFC 7606 as a future feature, uh, which is a very strange thing to say shortly afterwards. Um, I wouldn't believe if, you, if I said this to me. Uh, I really recommend you look at the full email exchange. Um, basically, to clarify, any ASN can emit a message with a corrupted v6 specific uh, address specific extended community. It will get carried around a bunch of global networks because of the transitive attribute. When an extreme device sees that, it will reset the BGP session. That'll likely be a transit session, uh, which will cause your transit to flap, and it will flap over and over again because uh, the root, when the session resets and comes right back up, uh, it'll receive the same poison pill and reset the session again. Um, this is actually, this is extremely bad because this might cause your transit to session to flap, which will bring you offline on the internet. Um, but also this might be really, really bad if you're using it in a core um, IBGP scenario, uh, 
uh, because uh, your core IBGP might have even less redundancy, or if you're doing a root reflector setup, that will bring down your root reflector sessions. Um, so this can be particularly nasty. Uh, and unfortunately, there's no mitigating config, and as I said previously, Extreme do not particularly seem to want to fix this immediately. Um, so summary. Here's like the platform status quo. Um, so default RFC 7606 support, that's like the A+, plus, no bugs. Um, so Microtik, Arista, Cisco, uh, X, R, and XE, BGBird, GoBGP, the NE40 series. The, uh, and then the second one is like the buggy series, the ones that people, the people who were trying to make do the correct thing, but unfortunately there were some bugs. There's always gonna be some bugs in software. It's a fact of life. Um, but those people include like FRR, OpenBSD, um, the Cisco NX OS series, unfortunately also has slightly buggy behavior. Um, and then finally, with the sort of middle series, the people who um, do have bugs, but you can, well, bugs, you, you, people who you can enable this behavior on to be safe, uh, but you do have to read their documentation in order to be safe. Uh, so that includes Juno, Juniper, um, Juniper and, and Nokia SROS. Uh, and then finally, the no, no support for the safety mechanism at all and no plans to support it immediately, um, which is extreme. Um, the general security response, uh, rating that I would give. Um, OpenBSD was fantastic. Um, they sent them an email and they very quickly acknowledged it, put out a patch, um, perhaps put out the patch a little bit too quickly um, since they published that fully. I regret telling them so early on, but that, that is what it is. That is what it is. Um, they, uh, I, I've, I've been informed later on that they are much more willing to do uh, like timed coordinated disclosure, but at the time I didn't particularly feel that that was the case. So that's unfortunate. Um, Juniper uh, replied, were very polite, very knowledgeable, um, eventually pushed out a Junos patch. Um, they have no known date for a default safe behavior, but I'm looking forward to potentially uh, them doing that. Um, Nokia also replied um, and later on confirmed that uh, in from March 24 uh, onwards, or March 2024 onwards, SRS will be default safe. Um, they eventually did custom communication. I feel like to some degree, uh, Nokia was only gonna do custom communication after I started manually going after every one of their customers that I was aware of um, to warn them ahead of this, um, but that might just be a perception thing. Um, FRR, uh, they had a really quick reply, uh, initially acknowledged the issue um, and then just disappeared. Um, they only patched it after I went for public disclosure, um, which is uh, unfortunate um, because obviously a lot of people can get harmed by this. And Extreme, yeah, asked, really struggled to find contacts for Extreme I feel like the security team really ran down the clock. Um, so they basically replied at the 11th hour being like, actually, we don't think this is an issue, which is very frustrating because I was basically only waiting on extreme at that stage. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's the, the worst possible security response. Uh, oh yeah, and then also didn't think that it was a bug. Um, so uh, it's worth pointing out that none of these vendors have a bug bounty program. Uh, so reporting this was kind of a waste of my time. Um, Reporting these issues is really frustrating. Um, I wouldn't ever recommend finding a bug that, or finding an interesting bug class that impacts a load of different vendors at once um, because it requires you to argue a lot of strange things in a, over emails over people who um, you kind of want to remind that you're not being paid to do this. Um, I would argue personally that it's not worth doing, but obviously with nuance, right? If, this, if, if you found a bug that could potentially de-peer the internet, um, perhaps you should uh, go through and it is your moral probably responsibility to report that. Um, for lower level bugs, uh, I don't think I will be reporting these bugs to vendors ever again, um, just because some of these vendors were particularly difficult to work with. Um, to final, uh, final security response thing, obviously the correct behavior in the first place means that you get an A+. Plus, um, and uh, from there on, yeah, very much a summary of all my previous points um, with just the RFC 7606 support by default should be praised um, in this current landscape. Uh, and that's it. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Ben. Do we have any questions? Hi. Seems is dead. All right. I have a question first, everyone, excuse me for my English, I'm from Argentina, so my male language is Spanish. Sorry, who are you? Sorry. My name is Arturo Baldo, I'm from IP Architects. I have a question for you. Have you ever tested this kind of box with different platforms not so familiar like uh, Dell Networking or IP Infusion? Those are platforms I, I work with. Sorry, was, was the question roughly have I tested IP Infusion? If you had tried this with IP Infusion, Ognox, for example, or any devices from Dell Networking, those are platforms I see on the wild, but we are unaware if they are affected by this. I feel like, uh, I don't know for a fact, um, I, don't, I don't have a pop, an IP Fusion box standing by to test that. Um, however, I, they might be, be using FRR behind the scenes, in which case they're bundled in the, the people who use FRR. Um, in which okay. problem. I don't know for a fact if they use FRR, but they feel like the kind of vendor that might be using FRR. All right, thank you very much. 
Andrew Dull, eight con. Andrew Dole, Eight Continents Networks. I want to say this is a real thing that happens in real life. Um, more than 20 years ago, now I'm dating myself, but there were actually bugs that brought down all of our Sprint BGP peering sessions, and I had to end up going through a debug log trying to find the exact route and try to block it before it got to my session to keep my transit up. So this is a real thing, and I encourage people to try to figure out how to get these things solved. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions for Ben? Good. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much. Good talk. <laughs>